Good morning, church. It's good to see you all. Would you please stand with us as we begin uh, our time of worship this morning? And, uh... Father God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this beautiful fall weather. We thank you for uh, the opportunity to gather together. We thank you for uh, those of us that are healthy, and we pray for those um, who might be sick um, and who might be uh, struggling right now. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
God, we thank you. We thank you for your creation, for your work in recreation, for making all things new. We thank you for the day when all will be right, where there will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow. We thank you for the resurrection, the restoration that you're implementing now, that you're working through us now. We thank you that you're partnering with us, your creation. May we walk with you. Amen. Now, as we move into our time of tithes and offerings, um, there are instructions on the screen you can give from your phone, or there are, um, there are bins in the back that you can give as well.
Would you join me this morning by affirming our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Amen to that. that. That's an actual uh, uh, transmission back from Apollo 8, by the way. You can look this up. It's, it's pretty cool stuff. So um, imagine you're wearing a pair of tinted sunglasses, and, and they're a certain color, all right? Well, when you look out at the world, everything that you see appears, we've all had this experience, you get this, it all, all appears that way. And so if you never took these, these sunglasses off, you'd never see reality. You'd think everything was blue tinted or green tinted or red tinted or whatever it looks like. And, and so we all kind of do that as human beings. We all have glasses, ways of seeing the world that we put on, and then everything that we see, everything in our experience looks that way to us. We all bring a certain perspective to life based on the books that we've read or the music that we've listened to. And actually, music is a, is a highly shaping thing. The band's coming out right now. Let's thank the band. Music is a highly shaping thing, is it not? Yes. I can tell that while they're walking out of the room, they, they all love that I called attention to them. They love that. Uh, so the, 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 the books, the artwork, all these things that we participate in, these shape us. Sometimes this is called a world view. You ever heard this term? A world view or a framework for seeing the world. A pair of glasses you put on and that's how you see the world. We're launching a new series today. We think this one is, is pretty important stuff. And I'm not sure everybody's going to agree with everything that we say. That's okay. We're unified. This is the body of Christ. But it's so serious, I want you to know that actually the leaders of the church have undertaken three weeks of prayer and fasting and taken this very, very seriously, that God would move his spirit in our midst as he sees fit. Not as I see fit, not as the preaching team sees, not as leadership, but as God sees fit to move. 
And so we're going to take a look at culture and, and the way that things are shifting. The entire world is shifting. And how people are perceiving the church. Because do you know, in the last, certainly in the last 20 years, in the last 10 years, in the last five years even, the, the world, it's shifted dramatically. The glasses that the world puts on to see the world. And through those lenses, how people see the church. Do you feel it? That things have shifted. Something is very different. These are not the, the good old-fashioned kind of ideological battle lines that we draw. Not that those were good. Not that those were okay. But something's really different. And we can't always put our finger on exactly what that is. But we know it. We can feel it. We can sense it in our souls and our spirits. Something has shifted. Something has changed. What I'm going to ask you to do today, not in a literal sense, but in a metaphorical sense... Maybe we could be more aware of the different kinds of glasses that we're wearing to see the world. Doesn't mean I'm, I'm asking you to change all your beliefs or anything like that. Far from it. But maybe we could become more aware of how it is we're seeing the world. And maybe sometimes there's a pair of glasses, the way we're seeing the world, that we need to take off. Maybe those are our Republican. Anybody got a Republican glass? Don't, don't, actually, don't, don't, don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> anybody got any Democrat glasses? Don't say, don't say that. Any independent glasses. Actually, you independents, you got a lot of pride too because you're like, I'm not with these people, right? So that, that's a thing too. Progressive glasses, conservative glasses, American lenses through which we see the world, international lenses through which we see the world, where there's lots of glasses in the world. And again, I'm not asking you to leave all those, those uh, beliefs behind, all that ideology behind. But I am just wondering, could you over the next few weeks become more aware of those glasses? And when the, some of those lenses through which we see the world are actually clouding, obstructing our ability to see reality, to see the things that Jesus has for us. That's a possibility for you, yes, but also for me. Maybe we could become a little more aware of the glasses we're seeing with the goal that we would see the world more Christianly, more through the eyes of faith, if you will, through the eyes of Jesus Christ himself, more consistently. Could we see the world more consistently as a follower of Jesus? I say all of this just to set up the fact that you may not agree. Not everybody in the room is going to agree with everything that I say, or you're not going to agree with everyone's reaction to the things that I say. That's, that, that, that's okay. This is the body of Christ. We're unified here. But what I'm wondering this morning is, could we be more aware of where we're seeing the world through glasses other than as followers of Jesus, the lenses that he puts on us because we know him. <laughs> wow, it's quiet. It's okay. This is good, everybody. This is good. All right. So the, uh, the, the series is called Good, Beautiful, and True. Good, Beautiful, and True. Why? Well, because really the focus of all of these things, of all of our experience, of all of these issues, these, these, these things, these critiques of Christianity, the way that we've seen the church... At the heart of all of it is God, who's holy and just and merciful and forgiving and compassionate, who forgives us, who actually indwells us. Don't ever lose sight of just how amazing that claim is. Who actually in indwells us. And we want to see that God, regardless of whether the things that are happening in the world or all the lenses through which people see the world or the way that culture's shifting or the way that we're reacting to it, whether any of that is good, beautiful, and true, what's really at the heart of faith is that God and his kingdom and his story are good and beautiful and true. So throughout this series, what we're going to do is we're going to look at critiques that people are making of the church. And there are a lot of them. And I don't think you need me to tell you this, unless you've been hiding under a rock for the last five years. Like, there are a lot of these kinds of critiques. We're going to look at those. And where it's appropriate, we're going to own it if the church, maybe you didn't do these things that have made people upset, but the church as a body, we're going to own it if there's places we need to confess and repent. We're going to do that together. That's one goal. But our primary goal is to say, listen, um, when our theology actually predicts, when you look in churches, you're going to find what? You're going to find sinful people. 
You're going to find broken people. You're going to find people who do things wrong. You're not always going to find people that are acting for the good, the beautiful, and the true. But what we want to do in this series is point the way back to Jesus Christ, whose story, whose person, what he offers to the world is good and beautiful and true. So we're going to look at these critiques, that the church has been intolerant, that the church has been oppressive, that the church has been hypocritical, that the church has been hateful, and we're going to point the way back to Jesus. Now, why, why would we do this? Why talk about contentious things in church? You got enough contention outside, of the world, outside in the world, don't you? You can't turn on cable news. That, be careful with that stuff. It's good to be informed, but that, 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 those like constant strong opinions that are just trying to make you angry, that stuff can take your soul. It really, it, can it not? That stuff can really take your soul. And if, and if you're a big cable news watcher, here's a little experiment you can do. Just stop for two weeks and see how you feel towards other people and, and, and towards the world and see how much that shifts. I'm telling you, it's a, it's a big deal. It's important. And so we're, we're going to talk about uh, th- these particular things that people have said about Christians. Why are we doing this? Well, we want the church to be a place. We want the church to be a model for how we can deal with these issues differently than the world does. Without the anger and without the rage. Did you know that truth, even truth that's held robustly and, and, and that's, that's uh, offered to the world with strength and all these things, truth and anger do not need to go together. Truth and hatred do not need to go together. Truth and ridicule and sarcasm and cynicism, these things don't have to go together. There is a better way. There is a different way. There's a winsome way, the way of Jesus Christ. So we want this church to be a place where we we can talk openly, we can talk honestly, where this is a safe place. There's all all the rage about safe spaces and all these things. Just forget about that for a minute. Where the church is the safe place to talk par excellence. Why? Because we love one another and what we really want is the truth above being right. You got to want the truth more than you want to be right. But, but this, is, this, is, this is radically countercultural what I'm talking about right now. It sounds like, it should sound like common sense to you, please, please, what I'm saying it should sound like common sense. But it's not. If common sense just means sense that we share in common, this is not common sense, what I'm saying right now. Um, part of that, uh, an, an aside, I'm trying to be disciplined this morning, but, but here's an aside. Part of that is you get a world that has shifted so dramatically away from the rational to the emotional. Now, our emotions matter. They matter a lot. But historically, and I believe even what Jesus is saying is, our emotions should follow the truth should follow the reality. When you take truth and reality out of society and all you're left with is emotion, then when you debate with one another, all you have left is screaming. You get this. All you have left is anger. All you have left is is who can give the strongest and most forceful presentation of their emotions is the one who wins. And nobody ever wins that because you can always scream a little louder. You can always scream a little more. You can always be a little more hateful. You can always be a little more filled with rage. So we want this, why are we doing this? We want this church to be a place where we can have open, honest discussion. That's, that's one reason. Secondly, we, we want you to be encouraged. We, I want to be encouraged that, that we don't walk alone in this world, that we have a shared faith with one another. While we see culture, as we see society shifting, I'm, certainly unlike it has in my lifetime, I've never seen such a rapid shift in the way people think and moralities I have over the last five or ten years. It's whiplash, everybody. It's intellectual whiplash. We want you to know that you're not alone. We want one another to know that we are not alone. There's a cultural confession of faith. I thought it was beautiful to say the Apostles' Creed this morning. How good was that? Together. Because it reminds us not just of what we believe, but that we don't believe and walk alone. We want the church to be a place for that. That's why we're willing to trudge into this, these difficult spaces. Last reason, why are we doing this? We'd like to equip you for conversation, for interacting with people. Do not underestimate how important this is. I, like, I mean, I've seen this over and over in my own life. When I have failed to represent Jesus well, and I've been arguing, like arguing, and I do mean arguing, with people over the faith, like as, as a teenager, 
I remember like sitting there with my buddies in high school and like debating the, the faith. And I bought, them, I bought some of my friends like mere Christianity for Christmas one year. Like I am a, I am a Christian nerd like you wouldn't believe. And so I, I've been doing these, all these things for so long. But, but it's, not about, um, it's not about arguing people into the kingdom. And we behave the worst when we're talking to people about faith, when we're fearful, when we're afraid of not being right, afraid of not representing Jesus well, afraid of being made look, to look silly as a follower of Jesus by this other person. It's fear. Where does that fear come from? That fear comes from not understanding the way of Jesus and how we walk in it well. You don't always have to have the answers. That's one of the lessons here. But we're also going to talk about what some of the responses are. We want you to be equipped. All right. So we're going to talk about a, a, a number of these criticisms over the next uh, weeks, over the coming weeks. Okay? This is a six-week series. Let's talk about the first one today. You ready to jump in? Let's talk about the first claim. Thank you for that. Let's talk about the first claim. All right? Uh, people claim that Christians are intolerant. We're intolerant. We have this claim that Jesus Christ is the way to the good life. The good life, what is that? It's what everybody wants. It's what everyone is looking for in their own way. And some of the ways people look for, for the good life strike us as really odd and really bizarre sometimes. But everybody, even the oddest, most bizarre, people are looking for the good life. It's, it's what they're looking for. And uh, so Christians make the claim that Jesus Christ is the way to that good life. And so people, so we, we say you must follow Jesus. And there are implications for your life for the here and for the future. And so people say, how dare you? How dare you claim that you've got the answers with all the different ways people see the world, all the different ways that they express their lives and the truth and reality, all the different religions in the world. How dare you say that you have the way. Now, intolerance in this world doesn't just mean, like, you, we're going to get to this in a little bit here, but it doesn't just mean you're actively rejecting other people. Okay? That is intolerant, to reject other people, to say, get away from me. But intolerance in our world, and I think at some level we all get this, but let's just say it out loud. Intolerance in our world simply means disagreement over the good life. What am I supposed to say? I'm supposed to say, well, that way is good for you, and my way is good for me, and never the twain shall meet, and that's absolutely okay. Right? That's what I'm supposed to say. Well, that's not what followers of Jesus say. We say Jesus Christ actually is the way to the good life. How dare you people? On behalf of the world, how dare you make these kinds of exclusive claims? All right? They're arrogant. That claim is arrogant and condescending and intolerant. That's the issue. Now, let, let me, let's do a quick poll. Do you agree with me? This is something we hear. Yes. 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 It, with an, an increasing um, intensity in our world, with increasing intensity, Christianity is intolerant simply because we disagree that there are other ways into the good life. So let's talk about the claim that got us into trouble in the first place. And you know who's always getting us into trouble, the good kind of trouble? Jesus is, oh yeah, good. Jesus is always the one. Do not expect, if you're going to walk the way of Jesus, if you're, if you're kind of, if you're here this morning and you're just kind of checking things out, and I, I met a number of visitors this morning, a few of you, and, and it's like, if you're expecting Jesus to not get you into trouble, I would like to send you a wake-up call right now. Now, he's going to help solve certain kinds of trouble in your life. He's going to bridge the gap to God, who you need to be with to see those troubles in the correct light and to even overcome them, be saved out of them. But Jesus is going to get you into, into good, holy trouble all the time. Aslan, is, he's not a tame lion, but he is, if you know your Lewis here, but he's good. But he's good. So Jesus gets us into this trouble. He gets us into this mess. When he says this in John 14, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How dare you? If you really know me, 
you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. How dare you? Philip said, Lord, show us the father and that will be enough for us. Philip, anyone who has seen me has seen the father. That's a claim. That's a big claim. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Jesus give, now giving a little insight into why one of the reasons he did all these good things that he did. He wants you to see what God is like, and he wants you to see what a relationship with God is like. Very truly, or amen, amen, he says. Truly, truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they'll do even greater things than these, because I'm going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. All right. Let's set aside for just a moment. Let's set aside the intolerance criticism for just a moment. Let's set aside the intolerance critique for a moment. Because a, a, a lot of times, in a lot of cases, and if you kind of look up people that blog and that write on this issue, a, a lot of the focus come, is, is on the exclusivity of the claim. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's bracket the exclusivity thing for a minute. Because it, it, it's a crying shame that that's what people talk about and think of when they look at this statement. There's a lot more going on than just the exclusivity claim. Everybody with me? <laughs> you with me? You out there? Uh, so, I, 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 yeah, I, I feel like, and this is serious stuff, I get it, but feel free to interact because I feel like you've all been replaced with mannequins or something and I'm up here and I'm like, I don't know, I don't know what's going on here. So um, let, let's talk about what's actually going on in this claim. So... Um, Jesus says he's the way. Jesus does not tell us there's a path you should follow. Here's a bunch of paths and you should follow this one path. Okay? Th that, that is, we'll do a little comparative religions, comparative ideology here. Jesus is the only one that makes the claim that he makes. This is it. You cannot find another claim that's equivalent to Jesus. Because every other claim is, here's a way that you should walk. Where Jesus says, I actually am the way. I am the way. Being with me, living your life with me, abiding with me, that actually is the way. You're going to journey many places. There's going to be lots of ups and downs. There's going to be lots of paths that you take in life. But at the end of the day, if you have found the right path, that just means that you have found Jesus to walk with you through all of the other paths. Very, very different stuff. And what kind of way is this? What kind of way is it? What does Jesus say about this way? And we ought to read this passage. The way kind of governs the next terms that come. So the way is a way of truth. Now what does the truth do? Does the truth oppress you? No, what's it do? Yeah, okay, so the truth sets you free. Why would that be? Well, it's a really lonely, miserable place to not understand what this world is about, why it is here, where it's all going. It's a miserable place to not know anything about cre the creator of all things, the one who sustains you. That's miserable. It's, it's miserable. It's lonely to not know anything about you and who you are and why you matter. Jesus says, you're not going to wallow in that misery. You're not going to wallow in that loneliness. Because I'm the truth. When you know me, you know the truth about this world and where it came from and where it's going. You know the truth about the one that, that made you, that formed you, that sustains you. you. You know the truth about the importance of your relationships with other people and how, how these can go well and how they can go south. All of these things, Jesus says, you know when you follow me and you have the way, you just de facto, by that very fact, know the truth. Jesus reveals God to us. He shows us the creator, the sustainer. He lifts us into relationship with him. Once we were lost, now we're found. Once we were in darkness, now we're in light. Once we had a spiritual, emotional, kind, physical kind of death, now we have life. That's the truth. 
When Jesus says it's a way of truth, he means it is a way of light. It is a way of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He offers eternal life. Now, what's eternal life? Eternal life is not unending life. Again, comparative religions here. You get other religions that say that we have unending life in in various kinds of ways. Okay, you become part of the universe. You become part of all things. This sort of ethereal cloud-like thing or whatever that looks like. For Jesus is eternal life. If you have sat, if, if you've been here for a year and so you've heard 50 plus sermons, I, please help me out here. Is eternal life future life? Yes. Is it only future life? No, of course not. It is like for Jesus, eternal life actually means life, real life, real joy, real peace, real contentment, real comfort in sorrow. He means that that starts in the here and the now. You're still going to walk through trials. You're still going to walk through difficult circumstances, but you're not going to walk through those alone. You have a hope for the life, this life now, and you have, an, you have a hope for the future. That's life. That's, that's eternal life. You're free. It's, it's abundant life. It's freedom from worry and fear and anxiety because now you belong to him. And imagine the best moments in life. Imagine the, the uh, for a lot of us, I hope at least, birthdays are great moments. Land, when we see beautiful landscapes, those are great moments. When we're affirmed by people from whom we need affirmation, those are great moments. When we experience victory in life. What Jesus wants for us and what, where this is all heading is that we will have those things in him all the time. That's life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's the claim. Now, let's talk about the background to this. So Jesus says, I am the way. The background here, in that context, in his day and age, is just like ours in the sense that people think that they found a really good way. People think they have the way to the good life, to peace, joy, happiness, contentment. They think they have that. And it's their proposal At the end of the day, okay, this may sound unfair, but I think at the end of the day, if you boil it down, the way that the people have found in that time is essentially a list of do's and don'ts. That if you can check off a lot of these or the majority of these or all of these or whatever, then you have the good life. You have a connection with God. You can make your way back to God. It's a list of do's and don'ts. Well, I'd actually like to say it's not just the religious leaders in Jesus' day. Every way that's proposed in our world includes a lot of striving. Yes? God is a God of justice. There is no justice without the just one. Like that, that is, God is a God of justice. But if justice is the way of salvation and seeking justice is the good life, then you've got yourself a list of do's and don'ts. You've got yourself a list of things that you must do to be a good person. Do you get that? Christians are not, I know this is a rabbit trail, Christians are not anti-justice in this world. We're the most pro-justice people of all because we serve the just one. But at the end of the day, the way cannot be a list of do's and don'ts. The way cannot be a list of do's and don'ts. And and let's let's just take it out of this this sort of big political sphere and just down into everyday life. And this last series, creating an image. If life is all about creating an image of ourselves. And for a lot of us, if if we really boil it down, we're really honest. That's kind of what life is about. It's about creating an image of ourselves. That's just a list of do's and don'ts. And if you can check off enough do's, do's on that list and leave enough don'ts blank, then you have the good life. You have contentment. You have peace. You have joy. Jesus' way is radically different than that. He says, actually, you you can get off the hamster wheel. You can get off the treadmill where you're going nowhere. This This is not a list of do's and don'ts. I had an example. I've gone past it in my notes now. I'm going to rewind. Rewind the tape. There's a dated metaphor if I've ever heard one. I'm going to rewind the tape. Um, I'm sitting with my sister recently at, at her house in Noblesville, Indiana, and she's part of an HOA, Homeowners Association. Anybody part of an HOA? I never have been, and I had no idea how pharisaical and legalistic HOAs really are. 
And, and so we're sitting there, and she's telling me all this stuff about, well, there has to be a tree here, and it has to be such and such kind of tree, and here's what the mailbox needs to look like, and I couldn't have this fence because it's, it goes against the HOA. Okay, every other way besides the way of Jesus, are you hearing me? It's like an HOA. <laughs> it's just, I don't know if this even works. Does that metaphor work? In all of life, your life is just one big HOA. To, to abide by. Thank you. I'm glad everybody's doing something. To abide by. Well, Jesus' way is vastly different. And people will make the claim. You've got um, way A all through Z, and it starts over again, and almost infinite sets of ways that you could potentially live your life. Here's what our culture says. Our culture says, you should affirm all of those as equal ways to the good life. If you're following a way, and I, I look at you and I think, well, so-and-so sure seems miserable, and th his or her life's just one big HOA, but I'll tell you what, I'm sure it's just as good as mine. That, that, is, that is what we're supposed to think. Let, let me tell you some problems with this. Sometimes people cash it out in terms of all religions lead to God, every, every way of life is equally valuable or whatever. Here, here, here's the problem, and it's just a really basic logical problem. One of the fundamental laws of logic. If you've ever anybody ever taken a logic class? Yeah, one of the fundamental laws of logic is the law of non-contradiction. One thing cannot be A and not A at the same time. It can't be both itself and not itself at the same time. Okay? Um, there are contradictions between these ways of thinking. So in, in Islam, Jesus is a great prophet. Did you know that? In fact, he's so great that God would never have watched him be crucified on the cross. So G there was someone actually crucified on the cross. Did you know this? this? This is true according to Islam, okay? I'm not making this stuff up. So God swapped out Jesus at the last second for someone who looked just like Jesus. His, what, what's the word for that? His do doppelganger? Is that? Yeah, yeah. He sw uh, yeah, it was Jesus, that thing. And, and he swapped him out at the last second. Okay, so Jesus died for our sins and to bring us into new life, or Jesus did not die. These are fundamentally different claims that they cannot both be true at the same time. There's secular versions of this. Either life is about what we accumulate, and our value is tied to what we accumulate, or it's not. The way of Jesus is fundamentally opposed to a lot of other ways. It, it's just plain it's nonsense. It, 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 it's logically painful for me. Any lovers of logic, it's logically painful to say these are all true or th these are equally good ways of getting at the good life. There's massive differences. Okay, so the punchline is Jesus does make this claim that he's the only way and what he's saying he's the way into is abundant and eternal life. Now let's come back to the intolerance claim. Now let's bring the intolerance claim all the way back here. So in, intolerance can be, let's see if Jesus is being intolerant here. Um, intolerance, if intolerance means I reject other people, I reject my Islamic friends, I reject my, my family members who are atheists or who think differently than me. If, if, if intolerance is rejection, which that's what I think think it is, okay? You're welcome to agree with me on that, because we all love when people agree with us. You're welcome to agree with me on that. I think tolerance is rejection. If intolerance is rejection, then Jesus is clearly not being intolerant. We're going to look at a passage here in just a minute. If intolerance is rejection, Jesus is clearly not being intolerant. If intolerance is simply disagreeing with someone, about the way to the good life, the best way to the good life, then in that case, yeah, Jesus would be intolerant. But I don't think that's what intolerance means. I think it's a misuse. Any lovers of semantics, the meaning of words, I don't think that's what the word means. I, I, I don't think that's what it means. It can't be, intolerance cannot be mere disagreement. Because Jesus' way is this. Let's talk about what, what are we really saying when we disagree. We're not being intolerant. And by the way, if the church has been intolerant, and I think in cases it has been intolerant, 
I think we, I think we and I'm talking capital C church here, because whatever you believe about sort of, sort of corporate guilt in other, other domains, and that's a big debate today, I get that. I'm not looking to weigh in on the corporate guilt debate here. I'm not. But there is a sense in which the church, big C church, the church universal and from all times, the church of which this, this body, this local body here is part of the church, we are one body of Christ. We are one family. These are the metaphors, everybody. So if the body is, is acting in ways that are unchristlike, we got to confess that and repent it. Now, this is one of these claims. You may or may not agree with me here. I get that. And I'm not saying just, oh, if you take off those glasses, you'll suddenly agree. And that's, that's not my point either. But it, it, is, it is not only okay, it's appropriate. It's necessary for us to own and confess and repent if we have been intolerant in the sense of rejection. But the way of Jesus, it, it's, it's more a claim, if I can get these pictures up here, the way of Jesus is to know truth. It's to know life. It's to know the way. The way of Jesus is less like rejection, and it's more like this decision that's facing this young man here. And he's looking at these two paths, and he thinks, huh, I wonder which one looks safer. And we say to him, go this way. This is the way of life. This is the way of light. This, this is the way of being content even in difficult circumstances. This is the way of finding comfort even in difficult circumstances. This is the way of life. It's a way of healed relationships with other people. It's a way of belonging, belonging to the, to the big C church and the local lowercase c church like CC Church. Go that way, not that way. That's what Christians are claiming. Not as fun? What do you mean? Oh, sure. That's right. There is appeal to it. But what we're saying here is, I mean, the, the, the claim that Christianity is making, it's less, it's not intolerance, it's not rejection. It's go this way and not, and not that. Go the way of goodness. Go the way of truth. Go the way of beauty. Christianity is less about what it is we reject and way more about what it is we gain. We got to hear that. We got to get this one, church. Christianity is not about what we reject. It starts with the heart of it is about what it is that we claim. And what we claim, it implies there are paths you shouldn't go. Don't, don't go that way. Go this way. This is the way of life. This is the way of light. This is the way of hope. Yeah, that other way may seem I, I, fun. Going into the darkness may seem fun. There may be some temporal gain that, that you get from that. But talk to anybody who's gone that way for long enough. And they're going to tell you, this was unfulfilling. I still haven't, the old U2 song, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I still don't get it. And so Jesus' claim is not actually exclusive. Jesus' claim in a day where these are buzzwords, but Jesus is radically inclusive. Jesus says, I am the way to, I am the, way to the, tr the truth and the life. Walk with me into this path of light and this path of life. Don't believe me, listen, listen to his own words. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Why do you get weary and burdened? Why were the people weary and burdened in Jesus' day? Because there was a way that was like an HOA in their lives. There's a way that was just legalistic and it was a checklist and they were weary. The people were weary. He says, come to me, everyone who is weary, go this way and not that. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke or my teaching, my way of life. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke, my way is easy, and my burden is light. What's the imagery here? Jesus is in a yoke tying animals together, and this heavy load that we carry in life, Jesus now walks in and says, we're, we're going to carry this one together. We're going to walk together. You're never going to be alone again when you have Jesus. So let's sum it up. Here, here, here's kind of what we've done. We've looked at this claim that gets all the attention because it's exclusive in the sense that it says, walk this way and not that. What we miss about that claim is that what Jesus is inviting us into is not just being right. It's not just the exclusion of all these other ways of living. 
but it's, it's the way, the truth, and the life. It's knowing the reality about God and us and the world and our relationships. It's about knowing life eternal instead of walking in darkness. And that is not an exclusionary claim. Yes, it says these other ways are darkness because that's just reality. Sometimes you gotta just say things that are real. Please, 2023 war- world. Sometimes you gotta just say things that are real, even if they're difficult to hear because you want what's good for people. We want to be Christians who, who we tell what it's like to follow the way of Jesus Christ because we desperately want what's good for people. Not that it's that we want to be right or we do want to exclude their way of living or whatever that looks like. We want what's good. We don't want to talk about what's lost. We want to talk about what's gained. That's the way of Jesus. Now here's how I'd like to end. These are going to go by fairly quickly, okay? So if you're, if you're a note taker, Heads up, these are going to go by fairly quickly. What I'd like to do is give us five, five at the end here, okay, of kind, of kind of what I see as biblical rules of engagement. And we could talk about verses for each one of these. We don't have time to do that this morning, but they're biblical rules of engagement. How ought we to be interacting with other people who do not follow the way, who see, who see the way as intolerant and exclusive and all these things? How might we interact in ways, not that are always going to convince people. I don't have a silver bullet for you. I I don't know how you're always going to, there is no way to always convince people. In fact, convincing people is up to God. Did you know that? Convincing people is up to Jesus. It's not up to us. But I think if we follow certain rules of engagement, I'm sure this list isn't exhaustive and you can come up with others, um, and and that's fine. Actually, if you do come up with others, email them to me. I love to hear this kind of stuff. But where we can represent Jesus well. Here we go. Go by quickly here. The first one is, let's learn to live without fear. This, oh, yes. So the, the, I mean, the, 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 so many times, let me repeat it, when we act in ways that are unchristlike, that do not represent Jesus well, is just because we're afraid. This conversation has made us feel back on our heels. We're taking on the pressure to, to do something in this moment with this person to convince them that only belongs to God alone. The pressure's off. Jesus tells us, I don't know that the whole, uh, there are 306, there, there's, a, there's a do not fear in the Bible for every day of the year, 365, and one for leap year. I don't know whether that's true or not, but it's, it's a lovely thing to say. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of do not fears in the Bible. Do not fear, do not fear. Why? Because God is with you. This is Joshua 1. Why not fear? There's got to be a why, okay? It's, it's crazy just to tell someone, hey, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Well, 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 why should I not be afraid? Well, because God is with you. Let's learn to live our lives without fear. That by itself will make a dramatic difference. A dramatic difference in our public witness. And how do we learn to live without fear? Again, there's so much to be said about this. But the punchline is abiding with Jesus Christ. That's how we learn to live without fear. All right. Um, here's one. This might surprise you a little bit. Be appropriately curious. That doesn't mean I have to go out every time and I'm talking to somebody that just lives very differently than me, thinks differently than me. And I'm curious in in the sense of, well, maybe I should jettison everything I believe. I can honestly tell everyone right now, um, the chances of my jettisoning belief now are extraordinarily small, infinitesimally small, because it's just become so part of my life and the way that I think and my psychology and my spiritual life, and I've experienced these things to be true and all this stuff. That all can stay in place, and I can be a little curious with people. Jesus is always asking questions. And if you've studied the history of philosophy at all, you know Socrates, the Socrates, the toga and all this stuff, always just ask people questions. A lot of parallels, actually, between these two. Obviously, Jesus is much greater. I get that. But a lot of parallels. It's okay to be curious. You're not abandoning faith if you try to learn from other people. If you ask questions to clarify and understand really where they're coming from. Because if you do that, guess where you're going to get to? You're going to get to a root desire. You're going to get to a root need in that person's life. That is what's going to happen. You're going to get past this, I'm right, no, I'm right, no, and just, just an intractable thing that we just do and do and do in this society to... They're really searching for something that we're all searching for. It's okay. Be appropriately curious. Third one is uh, see the Imago Dei in everybody. And I I don't mean this just theoretically. I told an Andy Crouch story recently. I don't don't know if you remember this or not, but he's, he's walking through the airport 
And suddenly he senses the Spirit prompts him not to go talk to a specific person. Those are great stories. This is not one of those stories. But to begin to see everyone as an image bearer. And so he walks around the airport and he's looking at people and he says, image bearer. That's an image bearer. He's probably not saying this out loud. I don't know. Image bearer. Image bearer. And he says he ended up in tears in that airport because he could not believe how radically it shifted the way he looked at other people. Hear me on this. Because of God, because of Christ, because of the things we know as people that follow Jesus, our doctrine, our theology actually says you have more in common with any person with whom you ever interact than you have different. Think about that for a minute. Yes, I know there's big differences. But if all these things we believe as followers of Jesus are true, and I believe they are, then we have more in common, our basic wants, our basic desires, our basic need for God, with anybody we meet, than we do different. Why? Because we're image bearers. Sorry, imago dei, it means image of God. Okay? That's what imago dei is. Could we begin to be like Andy Crouch in that airport? And I've tried this, and I get it. It is powerful stuff. Image bearer, image bearer, image bearer. And I've tried this with people who disagree with me vehemently on things. And it changes the ball game, everybody. Now that person is an image bearer. Okay, fourth, uh, this one should be pretty simple, but what if we lived our lives just pointing the world to Jesus? Every word I spoke and every deed that I did, I said, how is this pointing back to Christ? And what he's done, his grace, his forgiveness, his compassion for other people. Sometimes you're going to speak the gospel to people explicitly, and we should do that. But a lot of times we're going to speak the gospel implicitly to people by the way our words and deeds point past us and to Jesus. Could we do that? Could we be people that even in the face of hostility and hatred, we love our enemy? Somebody said to me recently, that, that's, that's the, the biggest test or the, the biggest evidence, I should say, let's not say test, the biggest evidence of how strongly Christ's presence is inside of me and working within me is am I, a, am I able to love my enemies? Can we do that? Last is this. I leave you with this because it, it is a, it, it's a difficult world. It's already there. Like, forget this future prognosticating. It's going to get so bad for Christians and blah, blah. I mean, in a lot of ways... We're there. We're not being, I don't think we're being persecuted. Okay, you can take this up with me afterward. I don't think we're being persecuted. But I do think the world has shifted dramatically against the way that we uphold. And I, I think that's, that's, that is going to get worse. I, I believe that. The trajectory of things. Because this is more, what we're seeing in our world, it's more than just a loss of faith. Loss of faith came a long time ago, but there was still cultural Christianity that people held to. There was an assumption that, yeah, it's probably true, but it doesn't have anything to do with my life. There are, and I'd love to talk about this, okay, so contact me sometime if you want to talk more, but there are intellectual patterns. There's an intellectual history that's much deeper and much more insidious than just a loss of faith. We got to remember this one every single day. Every day I think about the verses I'm going to highlight here in a minute, but the fifth one is this. Remember the end of the beginning. What this life is, is simply the beginning of the journey. It's the beginning of the adventures we're taking with Jesus Christ. And at some point, our lives will all end, or Jesus will come back and establish his kingdom and remake all things. But remember all the time that the end of the beginning is coming. Does that make sense? The end of the beginning is coming. Not the beginning of the end. The end of the beginning is coming in one of those ways, and the adventure is about to begin. And what is that adventure? God's going to remake all the evil and darkness in this world. All the other ways that are making people's lives miserable and make us feel threatened, maybe even as part of a church. Like, God's going to remake all that. We've got to remember every single day. Not so, we, not so we just sort of are constantly only looking forward to the future, but so we have hope in the here and now. Remember the end of the beginning. Revelation 21, I close with this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I imagine this. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and the new earth coming down out of heaven, pre prepared as a bride, 
beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. The way, the truth, and the life is evident to all people. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making everything new. We want to be people who represent Jesus well in this world. We're not rejecting other people. We're saying, go this way and not that. We want to be people that remember we are part of that world. That future world in the here and the now. We're citizens of that future world in the here and the now. And so we represent Christ with love and with compassion and as countercultural as it seems in a world like ours, with truth. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would, you would take away the fear in our lives. Take it away, Lord. We're not, we're not afraid. Yes, culture's shifting, and it continues to shift. We're not afraid. Yes, there's people that disagree with us vehemently. We're not, we're not afraid. We're not people who are afraid. Yes, we're not sure where this, that, or the other thing is heading. We're not a people afraid. We're children of the king. We're people that we have found the way, the truth, and the life, not because we've discovered something that other people couldn't, or they, they, just, they just didn't have the brains to figure it out. Like, that's not the point. We've discovered it because Jesus has reached out and taken us by the hand and taken us into that way that is himself. So we pray we'd have more of that in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us.
So I'd like to invite the prayer team forward. Um, and, 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 you know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. If, if that is resonating with you in w- one of the following ways this morning, I'd invite you to come forward. If it's, you've never encountered Jesus, you're in for a great adventure. You can come forward. And, and they, the, the people up here, the prayer ministers, will talk with you more about that. They will pray with you. They will make sure and get you in contact with someone who can say, okay, let's begin to walk on this journey. Secondly, if, if it's time to recommit, and that's okay, that's a good thing. We, we go through times that, that they're, they're kind of stale and bland spiritually. That's not God's fault. That's on us. Come forward and, and encounter uh, a, a new today, the way, the truth, and the life. And of course, the prayer team is always here for anything you would like to come forward and have prayer. So I invite you to put out your hands to receive the blessing. Now may the God of the universe, the God of all things, the creator, the sustainer of all things, if he stops thinking about it, it all go away. We're that dependent upon the hand of God. And that's a, that's a good thing. That's a great place to be. May, may you know a new level of dependence and reliance and trust on Jesus today. May you know that you're a new creation because of him. The old is gone, the new has come. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all the generations forever and ever and ever and ever. Until new creation comes, Lord. That's just the way we want it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go with God this morning.